WQEE 99.1 FM, The Key, home of Southern Sports and Talk, Noonan, Sharpsburg, Franklin. Hank Arnold here from Coweta De Force. Coweta De Force is Noonan's own addiction recovery support center. We exist to provide recovery support services for individuals and family members who have been impacted by addiction. Our services are no cost, and all of our information is available on our website at www.cowetaforce.org or Follow us on Facebook. The House of Light brings clarity to your soul, offering a safe space for healing through our compassionate practitioners, services, classes, and wisdom, plus the tools to support you in our retail space. Are you looking for guidance and direction? Stop on by the House of Light Tuesdays from 12 to 3 and have tea and tarot with Christy. The House of Light is located at 29 Jackson Street in Noonan, Georgia. Call 470-414-6711 for more information. The views and opinions of this show and program are not the views and opinions of this station, its management, or its clientele. Welcome into Health, Happiness, and Harmony Hour with Dr. Lewis Boynton. Your session has been booked. It's now time for you to tune in here and get positive vibes, great information, and and much more. Here is your host, Dr. Lewis Boynton. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining me here on Health, Happiness, and Harmony, a show in which we talk about psychology and some different helpful tips to help you live a more happy, healthy, and harmonious life. And as a matter of fact, I have been doing so much research on the subject, I'm going to be presenting a paper on the psychological narrative happiness and harmony at an actual research co- co- at an actual research conference can you believe it I'm going to be presenting it with some of the world's uh, best narrative psychologists and this is going to happen this summer for me so I'm pretty excited about that so as I've been reading and writing with uh, dr. Richard LaFleur we're writing a paper about um, how to form and how to understand better ways to have health, uh, happiness, and harmony described in the world of psychology so more people can access that. And I use a lot of different sources. I use scientific papers. I read a lot of neuroscience. Another one that's a really hard word to spell, it's called neurophenomenology. Ha, wow. Um, that, That is the study of phenomenons that help us to develop consciousness and then studying the parts of the brain that are actually used to create reality. This is all an attempt to create the next Skynet, which we're already working on. As a matter of fact, I think Facebook, Google, Microsoft, they're all working on a form of Skynet. So you guys want to rewatch all the Terminator (laughs) movies to see how it comes in the end? You might want to give somebody a call and say, hey, we don't really want to be enslaved. Call me if you want to live. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> we want the good Terminator, not the bad Terminator. We want the nice John Connor, you know, like the Christian Bale John Connor who's like fighting for us, not the evil John Connor from, you know, Terminator Genesis, right? We don't, <laughs> we don't want any of that. So, <laughs> But the truth is the human brain and the human mind is incredible. It's like a galaxy that we carry around on our shoulders. Now, let me just say about galaxies, some people explore, some people do not, okay? So (laughs) let's just remember, we have our own potential to explore every single day. We have trillions, trillions of connections that can be formed in exponentially, I don't even say, I could say quadrillion different combinations to help us get through life, to help us survive, to help us get through difficult times. But one of the best uses of our own brain is to create this thing called happiness. And it's just the best 
for you health wise it's interesting because if you have health in your life it's easier to be happy if you have happiness in your life it's easier to be healthy if you have health and happiness it's easier to create a life that's filled with really good things that happen in a row and that's called harmony harmony is a qualities a harmony in music is a series of notes that are pleasing to the ear it's a it's a sound that you listen to that relaxes you that makes you feel good harmony is different for every sort of genre of music but harmony in life is a series of things you do to keep your life kind of peaceful maybe a little boring but but it could be very exciting people could find harmony in in, in competitive sports people, people could find harmony in their life with travel and new experiences people could find harmony in their life with sitting around with good friends and enjoying whatever life it is you have to live and it when you first come into this world and you get up to the uh, teenage years the adolescent years more and more it becomes difficult to talk about and find certain things in life that that make you feel joyful because your brain's not fully developed till later on in life so you know you got to work at it a little bit you got to find things you like you got to create little events that make you happy uh, most people feel like happiness is you know it's a one-shot thing it's like a in and out it, you, you feel it when you get something that you want and then it goes away more and more we're discovering that you can have an enduring happiness. Martin Seligman calls it the authentic happiness, which is not like a like a firework that explodes and like you're like, whoa, I'm so happy, I'm so happy. But more like a feeling of contentment, complacence, maybe a feeling of fitting in, feeling okay about yourself, a feeling of accomplishment, maybe a feeling of just that everything's okay. And that if anything happens, I'm going to be all right. I can figure it out. In spiritual circles, you know, we, we, we call that mindfulness. We call that sometimes peace. We call that like an enlightenment. And it's a very, very, very interesting practice to have. And when I say practice, I really think health is a practice. Happiness is a practice. And harmony itself is a practice and if you don't practice things usually things don't uh, I guess appear as often happen as often I guess things start to slip away there's this thing called disappointment there's this thing called suffering there's this thing called shame guilt all those things and now I'm not saying the road to happiness is to never suffer Sometimes in life, just like the Buddha says, we suffer, you know? We suffer. Sometimes things happen and we can't explain them. Sometimes bad things happen to good people and you can't explain it. Sometimes we have accidents. Sometimes we have loss, you know? And I thought today I'd talk a little bit more about you know, my favorite subject, not necessarily one that we talk about a lot, but maybe we want to feel it very often. Maybe sometimes we think that it's not possible because the world keeps us so distracted. It's really hard to identify anything anymore, right? Because life gets busy. We have commitments. We have things to do. We have work. We have a bad boss. We have all these things that might divert us away from, from what... I think should really be our purpose, which is to live a good life, to enjoy the life we have. Bob Marley says, love the life you live, live the life you love. And I frankly think that's a great modern life to go by. Because if we all loved our lives and lived the life that we would love to live, wouldn't the world be a different place? Could you imagine if everybody was happy? I know, I know, it's a dream. It's a dream. Maybe we should have a day of happiness where everybody just tries their best to be happy. 
And I don't mean the kind of happy where you do whatever you want and like that, but I mean happy in yourself, happy in what you do, grateful for your life, grateful for the breaths that you take during the day, grateful for the people you see, grateful for the place you live, grateful for the relationships you have. And, and then having lots of things in your day that make you happy. Sometimes it's sitting with a good friend over a cup of coffee. Sometimes it's having a good meal. Sometimes it's, I don't know, some, for some people, happiness can also be destructive. But what I'm talking about is a healthier, more positive form of happiness where you practice positive psychological aspects of yourself to make you feel as though you fit in the world to get this thing that I love to call flourishing, where you can see everything in your past has brought you to the present and that the future is gonna be okay. So today I was, I was looking through this great magazine. I, I've been giving this out for about two months to different kind of people. I'm sometimes making copies of articles for people. Um, but this one is, has got a great article. It's Five Roots to Happiness. And the very top caption says, 40% of your happiness depends upon how you live your life. I would say it's higher than that. <laughs> it says, big and small goals, a different mindset, and new friendships are just some of the things that can bring more joy to your daily life. And I would say, joy and happiness, they, they could actually be interchangeable. But I think happiness is a little more enduring. Joy can be momentarily. Um, joy can be fleeting. Joy can be often unoverlooked. You could have people in your life that bring you so much happiness that you just take them for granted. You feel like they're always going to be there. Um, and this article says things that can bring you more joy in your life. And it says we'll show you the best tips on how to crank up your happiness level. So number one on their list is success breeds more success. So in, in counseling, we usually help people to um, set and, and reach certain goals. Once we get to a certain place in therapy, after we've figured out what's going on, we try to help people set goals. And the number one thing that most counselors will tell people is try to set something that you can reach. The best way to have success in life is not to try and get it all at once, you know? It's to do things in small steps that lead to a bigger step. And I know this is gonna sound like a foreign language to everybody under 30, but there's this thing called delay gratification. A long time ago, there used to be this thing where we would have to wait for stuff. Even food, seriously. We'd have to wait. Whoa. Fast food was not as fast as it is today. It was terribly unhealthy, but, but we would have to oh, wait. Today, right? we, <laughs> well, they do have a salad at McDonald's now, so that's the addition to the menu. And so, the idea is to, for humans, we were built at a time, we, we developed for thousands and thousands of years just with n minimal technology. Our biggest technology was fire and the wheel. <laughs> and maybe some some brief metals during the Bronze Age, you know, some weak metals during the Bronze Age. Then we, then we got into the printing press, and then we got into the modernity with the Industrial Revolution, and here we are in this mega hyper technology advanced world where we're gonna have quantum computers soon. But in all that, we evolved very slowly. As I've said before, our central processing unit is our thalamus. Our thalamus is a 124-bit processor. And I don't even know if anybody remembers when you could get the 128 and then you'd bump up to the 516 and you thought you were a hot doo-doo. And those were bits, not megabits. Bits. 124 bits, okay? Now, if you really want to know what a byte is, 
what a bit, byte, byte, bit, bit is, you really got to go down to this computer screen that you sit on and you look, they're divided in eights. It's eight squares in each little pixel. Pixels run across the screen. Each little pixel contains one little character. And each one of those is, I think eight, eight by eight is a bit. So our brain can only process a certain amount of time. Probably now, you know, there's some kid out there who's been on the computer all his life who could do about 128. Congratulations, buddy. You've gained four bits. You can't put a plug in. You can't change your processor out. It's the way we do it. So our brains are designed to, to have time. That's that thing you do when you do nothing. Time, time to think. Thinking is imagining something in your brain, maybe a, a question, and trying to solve it in your brain. Not on the computer, not with Google. No Google search necessary. You can use your mind to try and figure things out. And if you have information stored in your mind, kind of like on your cell phone, you can take time to sort of process things out and, and set a goal for yourself. Um, and if you do set a goal, like some kind of change you want to make in yourself or something like that, we usually suggest as, as psychologists to make a, a, a goal you can reach, okay? So if I say to somebody, hey, exercise is really good, and there's new studies out that say exercise is actually the key to mental well-being, and it's not a lot of exercise. It's 20 minutes a day on your feet, not working out for like a marathon, but 20 to 25 minutes a day, six to seven days a week, <coughs> walking, exercising, climbing steps. There used to be a, a health app, and everybody would su suggest get 10,000 steps. Which is, excuse me, <coughs> which is not that hard to do. I mean, I do 3,000 steps when I um, walk around and go in my office. So, I mean, I can do another 6,000 in the rest of the day. But the idea is to help yourself find more success. If you don't give yourself a chance to set a goal, reach a goal, meet a goal, it feels like any kind of thing you do, anything for change gets diverted and distracted. Think about if you've ever tried to do something new, if you're really good at setting a small goal to get to a place, it's, it's easy to do. You can take it, you go, I'm going to learn how to walk uh, 2,000 steps extra a day. And then you set a goal that's reachable, 2,000 steps. It, d it sounds like a lot because it's 2,000, but it's really not, you know? And then you make it one day, and you make it another day, you make it another day, you make it seven days, and that's success. The reason why that's important is success breeds success. There's a chemical called dopamine. Dopamine is the chemical that people love if you're a human. The idea of our opioid crisis was actually caused because the opioid tricks the brain into overproducing dopamine. That's what gets you high. Huh. The reason why people love smoking marijuana is because it tricks the brain into producing dopamine. It puts you in a state of relaxation. And you are high. <laughs> Dude. Burn the incense. My mom's going to smell it. Um, <laughs> pass that over here, man. Give me those gummies. But, um, you know, the idea that d dopamine in general is a, is a product in your brain that can be used to help you be successful and pr propel you through life to motivate yourself or can be overused and become a substance that you need all the time to function. The difference between a successful, motivated person and a person who is hooked on some habitual kind of addictive drug is a lot of dopamine in your system. And the funny thing is, is when you're done with your drug, when you're coming down, the reason why you crash is because guess what you're missing? You're missing something that helps you to get up and motivate yourself to do that. And if you do that for years and years and years, it's much, much harder for you to live a regular life. It takes almost, for most alcoholics, it takes one to five years to get their brain healthy again because they've got to rewire things. 
And the incredible thing about the brain is you can because of that multiverse that we contain between our ears, sometimes with a bad haircut, sometimes with a big forehead, but it fits in there and it helps us helps us to kind of figure out and navigate in our experience. There's even theories that because the brain is a system connected to other systems, that with our brain we connect and feel and create things throughout the whole body that, that actually helps us to de develop and perceive the world, almost like a filter, and interpret the things that are going on around us. All of us would say, hey, that's logical, but in science right now, we have so many theories about how the brain works. We're still working out how the brain really works. So, so remember, success breeds success. We, we think we know, but there's a book out there, Gove, that you should read, and, and it's 100 years of social science, and look at all the things we don't know. So you should check it out. <laughs> Number two, sleep for your well-being, not extra sleep seven to nine hours of sleep and I think I've said this maybe a thousand times in the last six years but we are finding out that sleep helps us to have harmony in our life you know why because there's a rhythm in our body it's called this circadian rhythm there's another one called the dial dial the 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 dialogical I think it's called the dial dialogical rhythm which is your daily rhythm yeah, that's a chung twister. But you have a daily rhythm, plus you have an overall 24-hour rhythm. It's actually 26 hours. If you get really crazy, our brain is two hours ahead of our clock. How about that one? Um, but in the sleep, you need to get into a deep enough sleep to dream. And many, many people have, you know, for years we had, uh, Freud, Freud was big on this. He would actually um, interpret people's dreams, you know, and say, hey, that's your unconscious leaking into your, into the real world telling you something's going on. There's a symbol, you know, like, like, a, like him and Carl Jung did a lot of stuff. Carl Jung believed if you saw, if you had a dream of a giant white whale, you know, kind of like Moby Dick, um, but a giant white whale, that means there's eminent, you're dreaming of eminent death, you know. There's, a, there's one that if you're getting chased in a dream, you're afraid of change. There's another symbol that says, you know, if you if you jump off a cliff and you're falling, that's like a, a fear of death that symbolizes in your dream. Now, we have this new thing called neuroscience, and they've studied this a lot. And what they discovered is that the brain, while you sleep, you get into REM state, you're partially paralyzed. Your eyes are rapidly moving, and your brain kind of in, in the very cellular level expands a little bit and we have a built-in cleaning system in our brain and these little microbes come in and clean out all the dead brain cells because you know depending on what you do during the day you may actually kill some brain cells for those of you playing world of warcraft all day and you know that what's that one where they kill people uh, halo um the other one um, um yeah you don't kill anybody in war warcraft well, you, you don't kill people, you kill avatars. Um, and, but it's like you have to have the sleep to clean your brain so it's functioning. And then your brain kind of comes back together and you wake up. And, and it's, you know, and as you get older, it's, as most of us older people know, it gets harder and harder to get into that state. So you have to work on practicing the art of sleep. We always suggest trying to figure out, first, if you're having trouble sleeping, Go, go get a sleep study done. See if your doctor will figure out, you know, what's going on. Lots of people have sleep apnea. It's, it's major. It's a major condition that can cause depression, anxiety, and lack of sleep. And also, you're not, your, your literal oxygen is like cutting off in the middle of the night. So you need oxygen to help you to sleep in a deeper way. There's so many good, good sleep um, tricks you can do. Make sure you're not too hot. Make sure your bedroom's peaceful, calm. There's all kinds. Of, it's so great now. You can get little speakers and put them all over your room and have your room sound like you're sleeping in the middle of a rainforest. If you're really into plants, you can get plants and put it all around, you know. 
You get some little incense burners or a diffuser. For sleep, you really want to do eucalyptus. You want to try a little lavender. And if you're ever able to get it, there's, a, there's an oil especially designed to help you sleep called Dream Time by Rocky Mountain Oils. This is not a paid advertisement, but it really will make you have these dreams like you're floating on a cloud and talking to angels. So check it out. No LSD involved. No psilocybin, nothing. Just a little bit of oil. Floats around in the air and it smells really good. But it can calm you down. Certain smells will calm you. I really believe that. And other smells will excite you. Totally true. Citruses, uh, ra uh, rosemary, things like that. The, the science on these kind of smell things is, is being developed as we speak. But more and more people seem to be feeling like they really like good smells around them, and that's kind of cool. And you know what? If, you, if it smells, think about smell and happiness. There are smells that help you to feel happy. What about, you know, like the smell of the ocean? Think about that for some people. The mountain air. People talk about that all the time. What about when babies are little? When babies are like one to six months, they have the most, well, I'm not saying all the time, but they have this smell, little babies, little teeny babies, especially if they're your family, they have a smell that just makes you feel good about the baby. It's, it's incredible. Babies have this smell. It's for the mom, so the mom will take care of the baby. It's this incredible smell combo with this little bit of hormone thing. And it just makes you feel like you're, you want to protect this, this little thing, this little baby. So, number three, mood improves in the present. This is a big one. Because with technology nowadays, emails, Instagram, um, WhatsApp, um, whatever, it is really, 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 really hard to stay in the present moment. But it's the best way to be in a good mood because it's a way where you can understand and appreciate what's happening now instead of projecting into the future or living in the past and past resentments. Think about it. Think about your own life. Think about you. Think about your brain. And what happens when you're with certain people? People you don't like, people you have resentment against. What happens when you're at work and you've got a lot of work to do? Are you present to that job and task? Or are you worried that I'm never gonna get this done? I gotta rush, rush, rush. I gotta get through this, I gotta do it, I gotta do it, I gotta do it, I gotta do this, I gotta do this, I gotta do this, I gotta do this, I gotta do this. You know, it's really tough to be in the present, but it's so incredibly productive. I just want to say that out loud. If you can get where you are, when you are, that is a state of mindfulness. And I'll tell you, as a person who's just created like a meditation room and started back in on daily meditation, it really puts you in a place to be productive and, and aware and to get things done quickly. Um, I guess around 2005. That seems like so long ago. 2005? Um, well, in 1966, 67, there was a Buddhist monk. His name was Thich Nhat Hanh. He was from Vietnam. He was very against the Vietnamese War. After seeing Buddhist monks burn themselves live on TV in protest of this war, they had, they had no other way to pro protest the war. They did this as a huge, huge statement against the war. I mean, it was the first time I think it had been ever seen that someone would do this to, to protest war, would, to take their own life in this, I guess, ultimate sacrifice to save their country, you know? But he, he started promoting this form of meditation and, and his, his particular set, his particular, I guess, call it version of Buddhism or the Buddhist um, uh, 
area that he belonged to, the philosophy that he believed in, and he started to talk about mindful practices and mindfulness meditation. It's been around for thousands of years, and most people who experience meditation, they do it in several ways. There's several things called tantric breathing. There's an Indian form, sort of more of a Hindu uh, sort of meditative state. There's a there's also some some meditative states from the Middle East, you know, from the from the Islam religion. There were these people called the whirling dervishes, you know. <laughs> they, they, they created a whole form of mysticism around the state of a meditative spiritual state. But Thich Nhat Hanh talks about this idea of mindfulness. And mindfulness is basically a cognitive process that keeps you aware of the present. The goal is to make you see how good your life is and to like the life you live. Sounds like Bob Marlin, doesn't it? But to really enjoy and understand that what you have, your existence, is good. And if you can live in the present moment, you can enjoy things while you're actually in them. Do you ever, you ever have something happen and you're like, wow, that was really tough and it was really hard. But man, when I really look back on it, that was fun. It's hard to enjoy things if you're not in the present. And if you just have memories, it's hard to enjoy things when you're actually doing them. You know, and that's that's something that we all need to to think about. Practice. It says uh, 46% is the time in in which people think about Something other than what they're doing. So think about it. Almost 50% of the time, you're thinking about something other than what you're doing. And we call that what? Multitasking? I, I don't think it is a multitask. I think it slows us down. Uh, an experiment is, Thich Nhat Hanh talks about doing the dishes. He says, you know, most people don't like to wash and do their dishes. Most people don't like to clean up after themselves. So they take their time. They avoid it. They avoid it. They avoid it. They wait. They wait. They wait. He says, wouldn't it be great if you just went at it without thinking about it? It would be done quicker. Maybe figure out a way that you can enjoy something that you used to dislike by understanding that it is part of life, that you can be present to the moment, that you can do this task with ease and that by thinking about it so say something takes you an hour to do if you think about it 40 if you don't do it and you think about it it's probably going to take you two hours because you spend an hour thinking about it and maybe even longer maybe even two hours and then you don't get it done it's really really part of the human condition that we do it because we're doing this thing we call avoidance this thing called, you know, delay, deny, retreat, remove, regress, whatever you want to call it. But if you can get in the present moment, it can improve your mood. If you can realize that here, now, at any given moment, a miracle could happen in your life. Here, now, it's pretty much a given that life Even if it's hard, even if there's things to do, that life itself is still available to you. No matter what your health is, if you're struggling with pain, if you have a handicap, if you're disabled, if you're struggling with a chronic illness, being more mindful and present in the mood helps you to get through things quicker. And and it also helps with pain. If you can feel into the pain, if you can notice where the pain is coming from, if you can relax your body and your muscles, sometimes... It helps you to cope with pain quicker and deal with it because you're there with it. You're not waiting for the next one in the future or not remembering in the past, oh my God, it's going to hurt, it's going to hurt, it's going to hurt, it's going to hurt. I'm waiting for the hurt, I'm waiting for the hurt. It hurt before, it hurt before, it hurt before, it hurt before. That kind of keeps you stuck. And I'm not saying this as somebody who's never had pain because guess what? I live with chronic pain for almost 22 years. And somehow, some way. With all of that stuff, I developed a way to deal with it better without, I'm not saying everybody's going to have this happen, but without medication. 
just in a way where I could use my mind to get through certain things. Not 100% of the time because sometimes the pain is so great that you need a doctor's help. And I'm not saying to avoid a doctor and just meditate all day because that won't work either. I'm saying be mindful, be smart, stay in the present. How severe is my pain? What have I done to help get rid of the pain? What kind of medical tests have I done? What, what have I seen? What's going on with my condition? Am I eating healthy? Am I sleeping right? Am I exercising a little bit if I can? Am I filling my life with good things? Am I? So, mindfulness gets you in the present. And if you can't get in the present, just where you are, take a break. Take a breath. Take a walk. Go, go get a drink of water because hydration is really important. And then make sure, make sure, <laughs> make sure that you can come back and be present to your world and life. I know it sounds weird, you know, be present, mindfulness, okie dokie. But the truth is, studies show this is science, not gossip, not water cooler talk. Science and papers show that mindfulness meditation helps you too. Make your mind, isn't that weird? Mindfulness, help your mind, or have a habit to have your mind function a little better for yourself. If it's a continual use of mindfulness practices and meditation, it can even help to restore things like concentration, memory. It can help you shift some of your moods. It can also make you say cool things like, I'm so spiritual, and I'm really cool because I'm mindfulness. And I can do yoga and meditate at the same time and all that stuff. So if you really want to look cool and get you some nice yoga pants and a nice little tight, you know, little thing on top of your head, that could also be a benefit of it. I'm not quite there yet, but I'm working on it, you know, soon to get my little thing on top of my head, whatever that is, you know. Um, number four, shift focus. Your thoughts can get in the way of your happiness. When you shift focus on problems rather than good things, they're the ones that come into your mind and affect your mood. Same is true when you compare yourself to others. There's this thing called social monitoring. High social monitors have a hard time because you're going, oh my God, what did I say? Was it stupid? Was the yoga pants comment about stupid? Oh my God, did I say something on the radio that made me look bad or am I feeling that? But as you can tell, that doesn't happen with me a lot. Sometimes I just say stuff, you know? I got a little, little uh, what do they used to call that? My mouth works faster than my brain. So stuff just comes out. But the truth is, when you shift focus, you can shift away from the bad stuff. The thing that I do is, even when things are going, you know, I guess when things are going fast in my brain or I'm focused on the problems, this is what I say to myself. I say, hey, if you just think about the problems, you're never going to find the solution. It's a mantra that I use. If you just think about the problems, you're never going to find a solution. If you just think about the problems, you're never going to find a solution. And guess what? The goal to fixing a problem is to find and solve that problem. As an example, maybe if I have a little bit of depression, um, I've been having it for several weeks or months it's really affecting my life i can't work i'm having a hard time staying awake during the day sometimes i feel like my life isn't worth living then to solve that problem would not be to stay in that it would be to try and find a way to get some help first try simple things eat right change your daily pattern get eight hours of sleep drink a gallon of water a day Take some supplemental vitamins, which include, there's a vitamin called B9 and B6. Those and B12 include those vitamins in your daily sort of chores and stuff. Try to go out and have more friends. Get some more sunlight. Go to the doctor and get a physical done to see if everything's okay. Because sometimes things that seem like they're depression could be related to physical problems that you're having that could be easily corrected could be vitamin deficiency could be you're having a sleep problem you get a sleep issue could be sometimes the doctor could say hey maybe we should put you on a medicine to see if 
if you have depression or not, you know, see if this helps. But the truth is, the best way to do it is to shift focus. Go from the bad to the good, if you can. And I'd like to say, there are people out there who believe that we talk about happiness too much. I kind of disagree with them. I don't think we talk about happiness enough. I think we talk about bad stuff too much. I think we show, I think we show too many perfect images, so we, we automatically look at some kind of ad or something and feel bad. You know, I think we have too much advertising and media there criticizing the human race and how terrible we are. And sometimes we don't have enough, enough out there in the media saying, look, there are bad things in the world and you're not going to be happy all the time, but you can work to be happy for quite, quite a majority of the time if you want to. Just in being present alone, you could shift your, your life. You could have 46% of your life back. Could you imagine that? That's like three hours and... 22 minutes or something. <laughs> I mean, you could actually have three hours extra in the day to enjoy things. And I, I don't think humans were built to feel sorrow all the time. I don't think we were built just to exist. There's some sort of theories that, you know, humans are violent animals creating this terrible world and we're going to self destruct. <coughs> Bleak. Come on, give me a break. You got to shift focus if you're talking like that, buddy. Or ride a movie. <laughs> yes. That's a good movie idea. <laughs> and video game to follow. Um, or a video game that becomes a movie. Like yeah. The Last of Us or whatever, right? Um, but the truth is, we can have joy in our life. It's okay. We, we don't have to be guilty about feeling good. We can have a life in which we in, endure and build and enjoy our lives. We don't have to make a big impact in the world. We don't have to take everything for ourselves and be greedy and gluttonous. We can enjoy the joy of joy. How about that one? <laughs> All right, number five, is it healthy to be social? Let's remember that. People who like to go on Facebook things and troll, <laughs> it's good to be social, which is like, Let's say social is not connected to social media, okay? Just want to say it. Social does not mean digital. It means in person with people, okay? More and more people are having intense anxiety and depression. I feel as though it's because as, as young people, we don't practice the skills we need to be in a conversation and feel good. If you watch all those old campy 80s movies with like Matt Dillon and stuff, you don't see Pony Boy Curtis and Dow on their cell phones going, let's start a fight with the greaser, I mean, with the socias, dude. Wait a second, I got to text the gang here, buddy. That would be cool, though. <laughs> <laughs> Matt's still like, do it for Johnny. Wait, I got to text. Do it for Johnny. Do it for Johnny. For those of you who don't know that reference, watch the movie The Outsiders. There's no technology involved. As a matter of fact, these kids take off. They take off in a freaking train, and they disappear for like a week, and nobody's looking for them. Eh, whatever. That's the way it used to go in the 80s, buddy. Parents were like, get outside and don't come back till, uh, well, <laughs> what, whatever. <laughs> And don't you get those cops coming by the house. Now go on. I'll beat your... <laughs> but the thing is, there was friendships. Maybe there was gangs who fought and stuff, but, you know, that's like a book written by a 17-year-old a long time ago. But there's friendships. There's camaraderie. There's The thing that's different is digital and te texting. You can't tell the context of anything people say. You interpret it as you want, good, bad, and different. Talking on the phone, you can get tone, intonation, sometimes mood, but you can't see the person. The only way to really build social intelligence, and more and more we're studying this theory of the mind, is through this thing called interaction socially, where you're with somebody and you follow the rules of a conversation. If you don't practice that, you lose the ability to be appropriate. And then you kind of skip off on tangents. You take charge of things. You really just go in different directions with the conversation. And, and you kind of get uncomfortable with the rules. What I've noticed, too, is a lot of people use a lot more profanity nowadays, which used to not be so much so much. I don't know. I know, right? 
like it's a like it's a a part of the grammar. It's like an adjective or gerund, you know, blanking, 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 blanking. And it's the oh, thing that freaks me out is people use it so casually. They're like, "Give me the blanky blank cup of coffee with a Big Mac." That's totally <laughs> part of a legitimate conversation, like yeah, because it, it used to be called this thing called slang. Now there's other words that we use for slang, but still, it's almost like that we've incorporated these things into our into our vocabularies as as we get less acquainted with the rules of being social. I'm waiting for that to happen at an academic conference where somebody just goes, F and F and F and in their presentation, you know? I'm waiting. When that happens, I will know the world is truly coming to a different place. But it's healthy to be social. Make an effort to nurture your social circle, even if it's limited. Go out and see people. Talk to people. Shake hands. Have, crack jokes. Meet for coffee. Start a garden club, start a book club, start a place where you can just meet, skateboard, roller skate, walk, talk, plant something, I don't know. Whatever it is, social is healthier. There, there's a number that's out there, it says six to eight hours of being social with other people. For, for a lot of people, that seems like a scary thing because, you know, that means I can't play video games for three to five hours a day. I gotta go out there, but the truth is, if you limit the, I'm not saying quit video games, but if you limit your technology, take screen breaks, you're gonna need something to do. Why not make it a social thing? Why not make it something that you really, really, really enjoy? You know? Something that's not competitive, something that's not gonna hurt you, something that's not going to make you feel like you're left out, you know? It's going to make you feel part of the world. It's going to help you engage in things. And there's an incredible thing that happens. The more time you spend with people, you gain this thing called social intelligence. It's where you can talk with people, where you can bring up interesting things, where you can have deep conversations that you can actually help you to be in the present with somebody. Because when you're talking with somebody, you kind of want to listen to them and you want to be with them. Seriously, without your phone. Maybe turn it upside down. What? Maybe turn the ringer off. No. Maybe go to the notifications and say, I don't want any notifications. Oh, what? Yeah. The, uh, the American Psychological Association put out an article this week that says, if you take a break from your screen, it's healthier for you. Can you believe that? The nerve of those psychologists, damn it. They said you should not be on your screen all the time. They said maybe you don't watch so much TV, but they said that in the 50s too, and look at us now. <laughs> As Eminem says, huh? <laughs> so think about these things. If if you want to be happy, it's not as it's not as hard. Those those things that I mentioned aren't anything you couldn't do in a single day, and they aren't anything you couldn't maintain throughout your life with practice. You will have good days and bad days, and, and sad days and happy days. But you know, it's always better to uh, create a habit that helps you have more good things in your life. You don't want to create a habit that says, you know what? I want all these terrible things to happen to me. And I just want to suffer because I deserve it. No, that's not the way a good life is. That's the way of somebody who may have a little bit of depression, somebody who may have a little bit of guilt, somebody who may have a little bit of shame, but so, or somebody who is told that they aren't worthy of a good life. And I'd like to say, if you feel that way, that's not true. Everybody's worthy of having a good life. It just, it just takes you a little practice in finding your own health, which is, for me, is de defined as, you know, a place in which you can do the things you want to do, a place in which your, your, your pain is manageable, a place in which you're getting the proper care if you do have a disability or a, a health condition, but also a place where you feel that your life is rich and has possibilities. 
the potential of potentialities is really where you want to be to see all these potentials in your life. And I'm going to have to end it right there because I got to go get to work. Work? Yeah, I got to do my um, night job. And I'd like to thank you all for joining me here on 99.1 WQEE, the new heartbeat of happiness in Atlanta. Yeah, I like that. We're the heartbeat of happiness here. Um, and we're bringing it to you live all day long. And I'm Dr. Lewis Boynton, and thanks for joining us here. And I will be back next week.